and welcome. A very warm welcome to the Green Bean. My name is Katie. This cutie, thanks, is Jack. And welcome. We're really glad that you're here. This is a channel where I share my creative projects, which cover everything from drawing and painting to knitting and sewing and spinning and various other crafts in between. Um, before we dive in in this episode, I just wanted to share some news about some events I've got coming up. I've got several in-person events taking place this spring and early summer, which I'm really looking forward to, starting with Wonderwall Wales, which is happening in just a couple of weeks here in Wales. It's my local show. It's a show that I've been going to for several years and I love. So I really hope to see you there if you get a chance to come along. It's a huge show at the Royal Welsh Showground. It um, has over 200 exhibitors across several halls and covers everything from yarn and fibre through to actual sheep and fleeces. And being in April, there are almost always some adorable lambs to look at as well. So it's a really fun show. If you get the chance to come along, I would love to see you there. And um, it's got really good food too. There's an excellent ice cream stall. And my personal favourite is No Bones Jones, the vegetarian curry stall, which I'm thoroughly looking forward to. Um, after Wonderwall, I will be at the Rivernitz Open Weekend in Weedon in Northamptonshire on Sunday the 14th of May, which is another lovely, friendly event. Um, there will be me, obviously Rivernitz will be there, several other lovely vendors, and um, they have sheep there too if you like sheep. There's always live music at Rivernitz. Um, it makes for a really fun day, so I recommend it if you have the chance to pop along. And then in June, I will of course be at the John Arban Textiles Open Weekend. John Arban used to be my local mill when I lived in Devon, and it will be my first visit back to Devon since we moved here in I can't remember, was it October or November last year? Anyway, last autumn we moved to Wales and this will be my first visit back to Devon since then and it will be, I'm really looking forward to it and it's a lovely event, friendly and there are some amazing talks and workshops happening this year as well as mill tours. So if you get the chance to pop along to any of those events, I would love to see you there in person. I really hope you can make it. Um, let's dive into this episode. I've got lots to share. Um, some drawing, I've got a crochet finished project, an update on my knitting and some spinning. But before we get on with that, let's head out for a walk on the mountain. I hope you enjoy the episode. When it comes to drawing, I've still been working away on this, which is my design for a new illustrated sheep tea towel, which features lots of different British breeds of sheep, 
all taking part in knitting, crochet and spinning related crafts. And I've been really enjoying working on this piece, which I'm sure you can tell. But for this episode, I wanted to show you how I correct a mistake when I'm working on Scratchboard. It's a question that comes up quite often when I show this technique is what do you do if something goes wrong? Um, and obviously when I'm creating a piece of illustration for print production, I can do a lot of corrections afterwards in Photoshop, but there is a way of correcting a mistake actually on the Scratchboard itself. And I thought I would show you that in this episode. So here you can see I've drawn this little sheep and I'm, there are two reasons I'm not happy. One reason I'm not completely happy with the face and another, the proportion is wrong. This sheep has turned out to be a little bit smaller than its companions and I want to change it. So I've sketched out the new shape of the sheep. The first thing I do is return the um, the bits that I've scratched off the surface and made white, they need to become black again. So I'm using a Posca pen, which is a paint marker. It's very, very opaque and permanent, and it creates a black layer that covers up the white completely. Um, it's not totally invisible once it's done. You can still see a little bit of the texture and the Posca ink is matte whereas the scratch board is a little bit shiny. So if it catches the light, you will be able to see that there's a correction here. But by the time this artwork is scanned and uh, processed to make it high contrast, just black and white, you won't be able to notice this correction at all. And now I've covered that mistake area completely with black, I'm ready to make my correction so I can now work back into it with the stylus. I can add the new parts of the illustration, but I can also work over those bits that I scratched away previously and cover up my mistake. And like I said, it's not completely perfect. If you catch it in the light, you will be able to see that there's been a correction there. but. It will, it's barely noticeable by the time you've got the new illustration in place. Um, and it's quite satisfying to be able to, um, to make changes like this. It's not completely perfect, but it is liberating for a, a medium that is such high contrast. You have to commit to making your marks. It's nice to know that there is a way of um, correcting and changing them if something goes wrong or if you change your mind.
hold on to your hats because I have a finished project to share with you. Uh, this is two episodes in a row that I've had a finished project to share, which is, I believe, unprecedented for the Green Bean podcast. So uh, you don't get used to it. I don't think it's going to always be like this, but I'm very excited to show off my finished cow. Um, I'm completely blanking on the name of it, Leah. It's the Leah Cow by Not So Square Crochet and I made this as a gift for my friend, um, a thank you gift because they did a lovely and generous supportive thing for me at a difficult time and I wanted to uh, to make this for them. So I'm going to pop it on and show you. I am so pleased with how this project turned out. It's um, not my usual colours, I must say, but it's not for me, so that's irrelevant. These are colours that I chose for my friend based on the sample of the Leah Cal, which they had said that they liked, but also inspired by the trans flag. And I'm really hoping that they're going to love it. The last time that you saw this project, I was bemoaning having to weave in a hundred thousand ends, and I'm very happy to say that that is done, and it took me hours. There was a lot of procrastination and avoidance, um, but I think it's worth it. A lot of people suggested when I was moaning about weaving in the ends that I might just leave them because it looked nice having a fringe, and it did, but actually, I really wanted to make this beaded edging, which is in the pattern. And I think it does finish it off really, really nicely. I'm so pleased with how this project turned out. I'm half tempted to make one in kind of earthy colors for myself, but um, I think I need a couple more months to banish the thought of all those ends from my mind um, before I even think about that. So now I just need to wrap this up and get it off into the post for my friend. The yarn I used for this project was Socks Yeah DK by Koopnitz, which is a blend of superwash merino and nylon. And although I don't like superwash for most of my projects, I believe it is a yarn with a time and place, especially for people who have sensitivities to wool fibre, superwash tends to be um, it tends to be less irritant. And also, obviously, it can be machine washed, which is useful and a bonus. And I really like superwash for socks, and I've actually got lots of bits left over from this project. Um, I bought some colours specifically, but I also used some leftover yarn from my friend Ella, who kindly donated it. Um, so I've got lots of scraps, and I thought I might make a cool pair of rainbow socks. The thing I love about DK socks is they knit up super quickly, so it would be a nice easy project. Although, I know what you're thinking, if I make scrappy socks, there's going to be an ends situation there as well. So I'm gently thinking about that idea. I haven't completely decided, but um, it would be nice to use up some of these bits and pieces and not just put them in the bag and forget about them. <laughs>
can't remember what stage I was at with this frog jumper when I last saw you, but I feel like there must have been some significant progress. I've been working on it fairly steadily for the last few weeks. It was the project that I enjoyed most on my holiday. And it's now at the point where you can really see some frogs starting to emerge. Now, this is a pattern that I am self-drafting, although the frog chart is based on a pattern from the designer Lena Holm Samso. Um, it was for a children's garment, so it was never going to fit me, but I'm uh, I'm using the colour work chart on a self-drafted garment so that I can make a frog jumper big enough for myself to wear. And the intention is for it to just be a very simple shape, straight body, quite oversized, and then drop shoulder, so no armhole shaping at all, and then a sleeve knitted in the round. So I'll do steaks for the armholes, steak for the neck, and everything, all the rest of the jumper will be knitted in the round. I fell in love with this pattern because, well, I love frogs, so I really wanted a frog jumper, but in particular this colour work chart I think is really clever. If I set about designing a colour work frog chart, I think I would make the frog symmetrical. And there's something about the way these frogs are just not quite symmetrical, and the way the pattern tessellates them together. They look all kind of jaunty and fun, but also from a distance, if you don't know that they're frogs, it kind of reads as like a houndstooth pattern. And I think that's really, really clever design. Um, and I really, really love it. So I think it's going to make not only a very fun frog jumper, but also quite a wearable piece that um, you won't necessarily realise how fun it is until you get right up close and see that it's frogs. I'm sure you've seen me knit colour work before, but if you haven't, my preference is um, to knit with both colours in my left hand. I'm a continental knitter. Um, that's not the way I was taught, in fact. I was initially taught to knit carrying the working yarn in my right hand, um, but because I draw for a living, I consciously made the change to carrying the yarn in my left hand. And it's certainly improved things for my right hand, but also, I now kind of when I try to go back to holding the yarn in my right hand, I don't really know what to do. So when I learned how to do stranded colour work, it just seemed to make sense to hold both the yarns in my left. So I wrap the contrasting colour around my little finger, the main colour around my ring finger, and then tension them both over my index finger so I can pick up each colour as I need it as I'm working across the row. The yarns I'm using are two different yarns from my stash. The first, the main colour, is Jameson's of Shetland Spindrift, which is, I mean, just one of my favourite yarns in the entire world. Um, this colour is called Lycan. and it's a very pale, kind of green, beige, grey. Um, it's one of my favourite shades in the range as well, so I've always got some of this colour in stock. I was very happy to discover that I had enough to make this garment work. And then the contrasting colour for the frogs is this one, Mohair Blends from Blackie Yarns, which again I've had in my stash a long time, I think actually since I used to work at Blackie Yarns. Um, so this is 50% Manx wool, 50% mohair, which is why it's got that beautiful sheen to it. And this colour is called Laydock Woods. Mm -hmm. 
Because the frogs in this colour work are not completely symmetrical, the chart isn't the most intuitive and memorable, so I'm referring to my chart quite often. And I like to use washi tape when I'm working from a knitting chart. Um, I, the thing I love about washi tape in so many contexts is that you can peel it off and um, re-stick it somewhere else, but also it doesn't damage the thing that you're peeling it off. So I, my most frequent use for washi tape is to mark my place on a knitting chart because I can move it up each row. It's really easy to see where I'm working. And I can't remember where I learned this, but when I started marking my place on a knitting chart, I would always have the marker covering the stitches that I'd just worked. So the next row visible was the row that I was due to be working until somebody suggested it makes more sense to do it the other way, to cover the rows you haven't yet worked so that all the rows you have worked are visible. And that makes it easier to read your knitting and see what the stitches are underneath the stitches that you're about to work. Um, and that was a real game changer for me in terms of reading charts. It just, it's logical when you think about it, it makes so much more sense, but um, intuitively it wasn't the way I started doing it. So that was a really helpful tip that someone gave me once. Let's talk spinning because I have extremely exciting spinning news to share. I have finished spinning all three bobbins for my very first garment quantity. This project has been with me for, um, I don't think I noted down the start date, but it feels like over a year. It's been a long haul, um, not in terms of being tedious, but just I've never taken on such a big spinning project before and I'm really excited to have reached the stage of plying it because plying is my favourite part of the spinning process. In fact, spinning feels just like a necessary gateway to plying. Plying is so relaxing. Um, if you're not a spinner, plying is the process where you combine multiple strands of yarn called singles into one finished yarn. So you can ply two together to make a two ply, uh, or three or four, or however many you want up. I mean, there's a sensible limit. I'm doing a three ply for this yarn. 
Um, it's my particular favourite. I love the kind of rounded, finished yarn that it creates. And also I'm hoping to create something a little bit, um, I was going to say chunky. It's definitely not going to be chunky. It's going to be more like a heavy DK or worsted weight yarn, but something that's going to knit up a bit quicker because once I've finished spinning this yarn, I'm going to be very impatient to cast on with it. So the fibre you've probably heard me talk about a hundred times before, it was a limited edition blend from my friends at John Arban Textiles called Barn Owl. And it's got shades of grey and orange and brown and red and yellow in here. And the resulting yarn is a kind of mixed heathered terracotta colour that I love. The fibre is a, a blend of different British breeds that I can't remember, but I'm pretty sure that there's some Wensleydale, some Blueface Leicester, and probably some Exmoor Blueface and Swaplers in there, knowing the breeds that John Arban often put into their blends. Now, I don't have a lazy cate, which is the piece of equipment you use to hold your bobbins while you feed the yarn off them back onto your spin and supply them together. And uh, I just wanted to show you what I use instead, because although having a spinner is an expensive commitment, you know, it can be very intimidating to think about all the other equipment that you might need to go with it. And actually I'm just using a cardboard box and some metal straws and it per it functions perfectly well as a lazy cake. So I've made holes in the side of my cardboard box to accommodate my metal straws, which act like the, the mounts for my three bobbins while they go in here. I secure it at the side with some rubber bands and that allows the singles to to wind quite freely off my bobbins into my hand and onto my spinner in the process of becoming yarn.
thank you so much for watching and thank you to those who support this podcast through Patreon or Ko-fi. Um, it takes me about three days to put one of these episodes together between filming the outdoor footage, the indoor footage, the editing and um, thank you Jack <laughs> and putting together the closed captions as well and I love doing it let's be th thoroughly clear about that I love this project I love sharing my crafts and um, and hearing from you but I couldn't do it without financial support so huge thanks to everyone who contributes and if you would like to join the community and help fund this project all the information is down below you can sign up for patreon for extra episodes discounts and access without adverts or if you just want to make a one-off contribution to buy me a cuppa or buy jack a biscuit the details are down there as well so thank you so much for watching thanks to will mcnichol for his guitar music which accompanies all these episodes and thank you for being here take care and i'll see you soon bye